my mom told me that when her grandmother began to lose her memory, that they built a little place in their house so that she wouldn't run off and be lost where they, she would hurt herself. And that was kind of her memory of her, of her grandmother, that they took care of her and protected her because she couldn't take care of herself because of her memory issues. I remember then whenever my grandfather began to lose his memory, that would be my great-grandmother's son, my grandfather, that uh, I was a young boy, and the advantage to having a grandfather that didn't have his memories, I could tell him the same joke, and he would always laugh at it. <laughs> and since I was little, I only knew about two, and so I could tell the same two jokes, and he always thought they were funny. And that's kind of one of my memories now of him, is that uh, he laughed at my little joke, which I still remember today. It was pretty sad then, I guess, um, when my mother was 58 years old that she began to lose her memory. Um, and so to see it all kind of unfolding again was uh, kind of nightmarish for us because she was so young. Of course, many of you knew her because when we moved here, she was in the last stages of her Alzheimer's disease before she passed away at age 64. It's a little more painful now that it's repeating itself once again with my dad. I found out um, just this week that um, from the psychiatrist that my dad is transitioning into stage five of vascular dementia, Alzheimer's, and there are only seven stages. So he's losing ground pretty quickly with his mind. Still knows all of us, and that's a blessing. And one of the good things is I'm able to go and uh, listen to all the old stories, which he tends to remember. He told me recently about the first time he saw my mother and how much, um, how beautiful that she was. He actually told me he had two girls in mind. She was only one of them. <laughs> <laughs> there is some advantage to losing it. You find out more information. <laughs> said there were two girls. <laughs> but uh, my mom won the battle, thankfully. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my dad, I guess it's been a year or so now, spent some time over at the hospital in the, um, the psychiatric area with, to be evaluated. And it's, it's kind of a hard place to be because you're not allowed to see your family while you're there. And my dad was already losing his memory. And I, I was able to go in and visit him. And they had listed on the board there uh, his goals. And I thought, if I was losing my memory and I, I couldn't control myself like I used to could, I'd be a little bit afraid maybe at what I might reveal as my goals to be put on, on the board. And I walked in and I looked, and there written were my dad's goals on the board. And it said, my goal is to go to church. And I thought, even with his memory going, very deeply in his heart was the desire to go to church and be close to God. And so as, as my dad's memory goes, and I, and I want to remember all the good things about my parents, this is a memory that I'll keep until I lose mine, maybe. But um, I was thankful today that David talked about 9-11 a little bit because, you know, I think as, as time goes by, we lose the power of events Upon our lives. And I remember eagerly watching the first couple of years after 9 11, the memorials they had there at Ground Zero. And I don't watch them anymore. Do you? Do you sit and watch as all the names are called? Do you tune that in? I, I hope you do. But I think what happens is it, with us is as distance and time go, goes by, the things that once were very powerful in our lives aren't so much anymore and there's a great danger to that because there's something that is really that is really powerful in our lives and that is to remember it is to remember things that are important is remember our past and the things that influenced us in our past in ways that draw us closer to other people make us more kind remind us of how good God is to renew our commitment to Christ when we remember, as we did this morning, his, his death and burial and 
the gift that God gave through grace to bring Jesus to the earth and to die for us. But as time goes by and as those become more and more familiar, I want us to always have a place to where deep in our hearts that those places, if, if our memory goes, that those things are buried so deeply that we say, I, I, I want to go to church. Because that, that's who I am. That's, that's who I planted into my heart to be. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16. Throughout, throughout Deuteronomy, we find God telling Moses and the children of Israel this phrase quite often. Don't forget. Don't forget. When you move into this beautiful land flowing with milk and honey and it's all beautiful, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget how hard it was in Egypt. Don't forget how good God has been to you when you're comfortable, when there isn't much struggle anymore, when you have your family all close around you and everything seems to be going well. Don't forget. Remember. Remember what God has done. Exodus 16. They set out from Elam, and the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger." Now let's pause there for a moment, because we're going to look today about remembering. And I have this as another point later, but I just can't resist to bring it up now. But it's easy to revise history, isn't it? To revise history, to remember it incorrectly. Is that really the way it was in Egypt for these people? Oh, we remember sitting around and eating all the meat we wanted. It was, oh, it was so wonderful. That's not even true. It, it's the wrong remembrance. It, it's, it's revisionist history. They were in bondage. They cried out. The Lord heard their groanings as they were in bondage. That's the reality. But now as they reflect back and, and they remember back, oh, it was so good then and it's so bad now. Verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. And it will come about on the sixth day when, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord, that you grumble against us. And Moses said, this will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumblings which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. Verse 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground, and when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather it, every man, as much as you should eat. You shall take an omer, a piece, according to the number of persons each you have in your tent. The sons of Israel did so. And some gathered much and some gathered little. And they measured it with the omer. That he had gathered much, had no excess, and he who had gathered little, had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. 
And Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses and left some of it until the morning. And it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. And they gathered it morning by morning, each man as much as he should eat when the sun grew hot. Uh, I I think I'm going to say the Numbers 11 passage for a moment. Let's go to the next slide. So the manna is there. They grumble. And... They say, what is it? And that becomes its name because that's what manna means. So it became known as, what is it? That's the name it was given. Because it, it, there was nothing like it ever before. Uh, imagine that you, you wake up in the morning and there's dew like there was this morning all over the ground when we woke up this morning. And it, when it dries, there's food there on the ground. And you go out and you pick it up. And it's wonderful. It's nutritious. It's delicious. And you can make all kinds of things from it. But there were a few rules of gathering. You're not supposed to leave it over until the next day, except when you're preparing for the Sabbath. And that day you can take two days' worth, and it will will keep. Imagine, if you tried any other day to keep it to the next day, you couldn't. But on the day you were supposed to keep it to the next day, it, it stayed fresh, and you could eat it. All a witness that this is God's great care for them, that this is a wonderful miracle And then in the evening, when they're all hungry and want meat, suddenly all come in all the the quail, and they can take the quail they want, and they can have meat to eat as well. Totally provided and taken care of by God. And it lasted for 40 years until they entered the land of Canaan. The Bible tells us that this was a test. In Exodus 16, verse 4, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instructions. And I think it's also... Uh, important as we consider the manna that was given, that God supplied just the right amount for them. If you'll take this amount and you'll have it for each person, it'll be just right. And such is true about life, the way that God works with us is He tests us in our obedience at times, but He always supplies what is right. Let's get now to the heart of the lesson first. Being grateful is learned. Being grateful is learned. Now, I know I I use these examples a lot, but they're the best ones I have with kids right now. Yes, I drive a school bus. And uh, there is one girl that gets off my bus, and I probably haul 40 kids. And every day she says, thank you, Mr. Powers, she gets off. Thank you, Mr. Powers. And I, I thought either, either she's some, a child who is um, abnormally happy, but I think maybe she had a mother and a dad who has been teaching her to be grateful. Because let's be honest, I think for, for most of us, we're pretty self-serving. Um, we, we kind of want what we want, when we want it, the way we want it, and we're pretty impatient when we don't get it the way we want it, when we want it. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult for us in, in the human condition to really learn to be grateful. But it's something as we mature in the Lord, we get better at. And so we're going to look in this lesson at how ungrateful the children of Israel had become for this free food. Every day, you have the whole challenge of going out and picking it up off the ground and eating it, and going out and picking the quail up off the ground that are there in in just big flocks, and you just have to go and pick one up to cook it and fix it for your family. But how that as, as time goes along, and this becomes the normal way that we're blessed, that the gratefulness of that is no longer there. They don't even notice it anymore. But I think it is all a part of this idea that we who are, are, are desiring to be grateful must learn to be grateful. So let's consider today these three ideas. First, we learn to be grateful by remembering the past. Number two, we learn to be grateful by observing the present. And number three, we learn to be grateful by having hope for the future. And this morning we're going to take the first one, and tonight we'll take the second two. Because I think as I've introduced this lesson, 
what a precious gift it is to remember and how important it is that we do remember our past and learn from them. First, when we think of the past, we learn to be grateful by remembering it. Memorials are very important. Memorials are important to remember the past. And so as we took of the Lord's Supper, why do we do it every week? We do it every week because that's how forgetful we can be and how important it is that we remember weekly. Have you ever gone up to the, uh, the square up here and looked at some of the more memorials that are there? I've done it a few times. People who have given their lives for something important like freedom. The names of some of your relatives maybe on those. They help us to remember the past. Forgetting the past and rewriting the past can bring grumbling for the present time. Let's look at the Numbers passage now that I skipped over earlier. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. It's kind of small, isn't it? I'll have to remember that next time. Numbers 11. And the rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. Now there's revisionist history. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlics. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Now, the manna was like coriander seed. The people would go out to gather and grind it between two millstones or beat it with a mortar, boil it in a pot, and make cakes with it. And the taste was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. And Moses heard the people weeping throughout the families, each man at the doorway of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. So this shows how far ungratefulness can, can go. To think about these people who for every day just had to get up and take the food off the ground and pick the meat up off of the ground and cook it and eat it. And now they're all weeping and they're grumbling. We are so tired of this food. And that can happen. I, Michael, you probably get tired of the food at the cafeteria at Hardy sometimes, don't you? <laughs> Maybe it's the same all the time. But it's easy for us if, if we lose sight of the past and the, how good God has been to become ungrateful for those things in our lives. And such was true here. Their ungratefulness led to their own grumbling. Consider two ways of looking back. First, living in the past can block gratefulness in the present. They couldn't see the good thing that God was giving them because all they could do was look back at how good they thought or misremembered things were in the past. It really wasn't that great in the past. But when they look back to the past, the past blocked them from being grateful in the present. So I, I wonder, now I want you to think about this because do you think that living in the past sometimes blocks us from enjoying the present? That the, the, way, the bad things that have happened to me in the past consume me so much that I can't even enjoy God's blessings today. I can't see what a beautiful, cool morning it is, the clear sky, the balloons floating in the air, and the beauty of this day because I'm so shackled by the bad things that have happened to me yesterday or last week or last month. But if we remember God's faithfulness in the past, it gives us confidence that he'll help us now. So we can look at it in the past and it can be shackles for us. Or we can look at the past and it can be where we see clearly God working in the past, 
and then understand that he's available in the present. And that's a blessing. One thinks back, sends thanks to God for the blessings received and fortified by the thought that one was blessed in the past, goes courageously forward to meet the unknown, strong in the certainty that God will help again. Now let's consider a few things and the lesson will be yours. First, taking for granted what God has done leads to ungratefulness. Take an inventory of how blessed we are. I'm here, we sit in an air-conditioned building on padded seats, dressed in our fine clothes, filled with breakfast, waiting for lunch. Blessed. For what would we complain today? And when we look and we think, and we remember God's goodness upon us, can we not allow, looking at the past and seeing how good God is, allow us to be content and happy and blessed and grateful in our present? And so here the people stand at the doors of their, uh, of their tents, and they look out, and they despise God's goodness. All we see is this manna. Are you kidding? Free food that God provides? A miraculous food product that you can go and eat? And quail that comes in? All we see is this manna. Well, sometimes if we aren't careful... We become ungrateful because all we can see are the problems in our lives and we miss the blessings. And so whenever we begin to misinterpret or reinterpret the past, we begin to gripe. And griping is really a bad habit. And it's easy to get into that gripe mode. I wish this was different than that. And so here we go. Because we are ungrateful, we gripe. But griping is ultimately ungrateful and displeasing to God. And you can reference 1 Corinthians 10 if you would like. But it was because of their grumblings that the Bible uses as a word there that they were displeasing to him. Missing out on the blessings. Missing out on being grateful. You know, it's really my goal in this lesson today to get you to look back at your past. And when you remember the past, that you see the ways that God worked in your past that will make you grateful today for your present. Notice with regards to the manna in Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3. Moses says, and he humbled you and let you be hungry. And he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Isn't that something that even with regards to the feeding of manna, that God had a greater purpose And that was to teach them that life is more than food. And that ultimately being fed of God in our souls is what is ultimately important. Now, where was this passage quoted in the New Testament? Under what circumstance? Who said these words to Satan? Jesus did. Remember? Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus used these words to set things back right in the perspective that they should be. Let's bow for a prayer. Father, I'm thankful that you've given us the gift of remembering. And that we will, as we look upon our past, that as as we see the problems in our past, that we will mostly see you working in our past. 
and that as we see your powerful presence at work in our past, that we can be grateful for today. We look particularly, Lord, at the great gift of Jesus, and we marvel at the depth of that kind of love that you would express to us, the great amount of sacrifice personally that you would endure as you watched your son die, and that as we look upon the things like this in our past, that the power of those events will not diminish and that we will remember not just the facts of what happened, but that we will remember the importance of what happened and that that, that will motivate us today to sing and to be happy and to rejoice and to honor you as we remember those things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and have an invitation song now. If you'd like to respond, sing with your hearts. Will you come? For the cross.